You got enough room, Paul? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome to another edition of Critical Issues, Alternative Views. I'm Ron Kramer, and I'll be the host for today's program. I'm a professor of sociology at Western Michigan University. I'm joined by the regular crew today, uh, which includes Don Cooney to my left, who is a professor in the School of Social Work at Western Michigan University, and also a city commissioner here in the city of Kalamazoo. Felix Brooks has also joined us now as one of the regular Viewmeisters, as Bill O'Brien used to call us. <laughs> uh, Felix also teaches at Western in the criminal justice program. But his uh, most important job right now is as the director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Kalamazoo Valley Community College. Correct. And we'd like to welcome back to the program as a special guest today, uh, Professor Paul Clements. Uh, Paul's no stranger to the program. He's been on a number of times. He's a professor of political science at Western Michigan University, and he was the Democratic Party's candidate for the 6th Congressional District in the uh, fall election last fall. So welcome back to the program, Paul. Thanks, Ron. Uh, so we're here today to focus on the uh, President's uh, State of the Union address. President Obama gave the uh, address on January 20th, and uh, it seemed to me it was rather self-assured throughout, uh, <laughs> uh, despite the results of last fall's election, which did not quite go uh, the Democratic Party's way. Uh, the Republicans recaptured the Senate and uh, increased their lead in the House. Uh, but Obama seemed very, uh, very confident and uh, waded right in there and uh, talked about the team playing in the fourth quarter. You can al almost imagine the football team holding up, you know, going into the fourth quarter, holding up their <laughs> four fingers, right? So he seemed to indicate that he's not going to be any kind of lame duck and seemed to outline what I would call sort of a pro-pragmatic progressive agenda. So let's, let's get into the uh, details of the State of the Union. So Paul, let me turn to you first and uh, just your overall impression of the President's speech and what do you see happening uh, with the agenda that he outlined in the Congress coming forward here. Sure, yeah, no, I thought that it was a very strong speech. Um, it's saying that it's time to, to recapture a kind of a middle class economics. Mm -hmm. We've seen 35 years of trickle down, <coughs> and we know that doesn't work. <laughs> with those 35 years of trickle down, we see here in Michigan that 100% um, of the economic gains have gone to the top 1% in Michigan this, this 35 years. And it's not that much difference around the country. Mm -hmm. So to recover an economy that's gonna be working for everybody, to be, you know, he's talking about investing in education, changing the tax structure, uh, closing those loopholes for corporations. I think he's setting up an agenda for these next two years that's gonna make it very, very clear what the difference is between being a Democrat and being a Republican in terms of the, the, the consequences for the well-being of the majority of our population. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think that part of that then is uh, setting up uh, <coughs> Democratic candidates in 2016? Do you think that was part of what he was trying to do there you know, for the next presidential may, uh, may campaign be, and the next may congressional be indir campaign? Maybe indirectly, <coughs> mm -hmm. but frankly what I think he was doing was he spent six years getting, getting us back onto recovery from the mm -hmm. com complete crisis that he, that he inherited when he first came in. You know, he made a lot of promises when he first ran for president. And I was disappointed that in his first term, he didn't get to, get to keep all of them. Mm -hmm. Be but, you know, he got in and there was this, we were in, in, in danger of entering a whole new, a whole new depression. Mm -hmm. and, and he got us out of that. Yeah. So yeah. now he's got back, we're, the, con the economy is in pretty good shape. We're moving forward. Now we're really seeing his true colors come mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. And I think he was just saying, look, this is where the country needs to go. I'm the president, mm -hmm. and this is where we need to go. And yeah, it turns out that sets us up pretty well mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. 2016. Yeah, I, I would think that progressives have to be pretty pleased with uh, that speech overall. I think there were many, many things in there to like. Uh, a, a couple of things that I would certainly quibble about, and we'll probably get into those mm -hmm. later on, but I think in general, particularly on the domestic issues and uh, dealing with economic issues, I thought it was a very strong speech. Yeah. Uh, Felix, yeah. Uh, yeah, what's your take I, I on it? I would agree with Dr. Clements there because one of the things the president went a long ways towards doing in that speech was saying, listen, America, where we've come from six years ago, this country had almost bottomed out economically. And so he wanted to highlight how far we've come, 
go into some detail about the data of un the unemployment status, you know, the number of jobs that have been created during this administration, and all these positive things that I think some of the Democrats who ran last fall who, as, and got beat ran away from him on. Didn't want him to be cam campaigning those things, the very things that I thought might have been helpful for them in their campaigns. But he also spoke like a man who knows he doesn't have to run again. So the shackles are off now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was a bit more combative, which, you know, which I liked seeing from him. And, and, he, and he challenged the Republicans and said, you know, the areas where we can work together, I'm willing to work with, with you guys and, and women, but the areas that we can't work together, are you going to send me legislation that, that you know that, that I'm not going to agree with? I'm going to veto. And I'm mm -hmm. going to put that out there so that you know that what, you know, what, a, what that line in the sand is. So he was very, very confident in the way he spoke. But I think the points he illustrated about the, how far we've come from where we were in 2008 should not be lost on most people who watch that speech. Mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. let, let people know that we've, we've come a long way. We've, we have made progress. Contrary to what you've heard the opposition say, we're nowhere near as bad a shape as we were when I took, the, when I took this job. I'm going to mm -hmm. leave it in better shape when I leave, whoever, whoever comes in and assumes office. Our culture tends to have a lot of historical amnesia yeah. uh, about all kinds of things, but certainly uh, yeah, I don't think many people can uh, actually go back and remember how dire things yeah. were uh, in 2008 uh, during the fall campaign and uh, how drastic the situation really was. That we were on the verge of a, another ma major depression. And uh, so Obama took office at a very, very difficult time. Not only did he have to deal with that economic crisis, but... The two wars. He had the two wars that were still raging and... Uh, Although I'm, I'm disappointed somewhat in the overall way in which he's handled those situations still, a very difficult set of circumstances confronting any president to have to pay attention to a looming depression at the same time, have mm -hmm. to have some major foreign policy things on the plate. So, yeah, I think it was very important to remind people where we were yeah. in 2008 and uh, what, what has been accomplished since then. And that we have reason to be optimistic going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> John, what about you? What do you think? Well, he sure can give a great speech, can he? I mean, <laughs> the guy's a, a, a wonderful orator, and he hit the right notes. He talked about the issues that we're, we're facing, um, particularly the diminishing middle class, inequality, um, the climate change. He, he spoke, I thought, very strong on that. But I don't think the issue is there. The issue is creating movements to fight for the things that he's talking about. Um, so, I mean, you saw the 60 Minutes on Sunday night when uh, Boehner and the other guy Speaker get up McConnell, there. McConnell, yeah. McConnell get up there and just say, you know, that don't make any difference. We're, we're not doing any of that, you know. Dead on arrival. Dead on arrival. So the, he's like setting an agenda out there, but the the... The real issue is, how's the country going to react to that? Are, we going to be move, is, are there going to be movements develop over the next couple of years to fight for these things or not? And I think he set a pretty good tone. Um, and I think it's up to us in the community to mobilize to fight for those things. Mm -hmm. And I think one of those things you mentioned that was the, the whole proposal for free community college. Yeah. Which resonated with a lot of folks in the country who, you know, yeah. who have sons and daughters who have these long-term student loan legacy costs. So that resonates. That's something I think that, you know, you can get some movement on. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I think that there is some common ground there. If the other side of this yeah. wants to do anything, or do they just want to stall through yeah. another two years yeah. and let ordinary people go down further, or are we really going to try to solve some problems? And, and you know, and I think there's some risk associated with the other side being obstructionist over these yes. next two years. Yes. because. Whether we want to talk about it or not, everybody's got their eye on 2016. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I don't think the Republicans want to have a legacy of two more years of being intractable. Right. Because then it says, well, how, what kind of leaders would you be if, you, if, we, if we have elected a president Republican that's elected? What kind of leadership are we going to have? You have two years to show the country that you can actually move. And so th there's a difficult task for them, too. I think you're absolutely right. And I think one of their responses was to begin to at least acknowledge the problem of inequality yeah. and that we have to do something about this. Now, I don't like their answers, but at least they're acknowledging the problem and there's some movement there in that direction.
Yeah, but it's, go ahead, Paul. Well, there, there is a little bit of movement, but as you were saying, the president laid out a pretty significantly progressive agenda. Mm -hmm. And for the Republican, Republican to come right back and say that that's dead in the water, yeah. well, that's letting people know yeah. that they're probably not going to be able to get their act together mm -hmm. to give the kind of cooperation that'll be needed to let, to let people see that they really do care about this increasing inequality. Yeah. I mean, look at their record. Oh, they're hard. the ones who've been driving this all the way through. So I would be delighted if they came back in, forward in, in favor of free community college. I would be delighted if they came back and said, yeah, you know, we really do need to cut interest rates on student loans. Right. But they're going to be going against their old positions sure. if they do that. Or they supported the, the minimum wage. You know, exactly. Minimum wage, right. you know. Child care. Yeah. I mean, how, how could they be not willing to step forward on child care when all the evidence is what a detriment that is to people getting jobs? And then the other piece to that was you know, when the president made his statements about equal pay to watch the optics in the room, who stood up and who didn't, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So John Boehner sits there and, and uh, doesn't clap, and right. uh, so he's opposed to equal pay yeah. for people? <laughs> of course he yeah, is. Yeah, that, that's, there's a campaign commercial right there, yeah. I think, right? <laughs> the president uh, espousing this position and the Republicans sitting on their hands yeah. on that. Right. So, yeah. uh, the other, and again, paid sick leave, uh, I thought was another significant proposal yeah. that the president uh, laid out there and this is extremely important to uh, many, many people, uh, so many families. We're, we're the uh, only country of, of the industrialized countries that doesn't have a minimum amount of sick pay, sick leave for their employees. Yeah. You know, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, the other European countries, they all have that and those countries' economies haven't imploded, you know, it hasn't been, it hasn't been you know, a detriment to them at all. And that's a developing refrain. Yeah. We're the only industrialized country that's not doing yeah. this. We're the only industrialized country that's not doing health care. We're the only industrialized country that's not pr providing college at affordable or free. Yeah. So we got a long way to go. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's so many of the proposals as the president's laying them out, you know, and again, this is me because of my progressive agenda, I guess, or my, my the progressive uh, ideology that I, that I have, but I'm sitting there, I think, that just, that's just common sense. Yeah, yeah exactly. I agree with that. Absolutely. Why, why haven't we done that already? Uh, who could oppose that? Who, who could be against that? That's just it's such a sane, sensible, common sense thing, decent thing to do to help people uh, survive in, in, in tough economic times. Who, who could be against that? And then you turn right around and listen to the Republican response or hear McConnell and Boehner being interviewed on 60 Minutes, and it's just like they live in a totally different world. And they do, because they, they are isolated from all those problems, and the people that they deal with are isolated from those problems, so they don't see those people, and they can. I mean, it's the same thing that Michael Harrington talked about years ago in The Other America, that it was possible to isolate yourself from these problems, and that's what I think they do continually. And, and, when, you, and when you're isolated, like you're saying, Don, what happens is you never, ever hear a competing narrative for your set of beliefs. Right. So you're sort of right. monolithic in the way you think. Yes. You know, there's not there's not any anything in the way of dissenting voices. So you're going to carry that narrative out in almost everything you do and how you see the world. Because you know, who's going to challenge that set of beliefs? Yeah. And yeah. That, and that goes right back to the Republican Party's problems with diversity. As long as they stay in a fairly exclusive club, they're not going to have a diversity of opinions. Right. You know, people are people shy away because they don't they don't want to deal with that because they know they're not going to be wanted in that in that in that environment if they have different differing views. And they're told we're not real, real Republicans or we're not real conservatives, because a real conservative would never think that way. Exactly right. Exactly right. And I think there's a challenge here for the Democrats. I think the Democrats have to force them to confront these issues in their yep. district. I think we have to do, yep. Paul, I talked to you about that before, I think we as, as Democrats right. have to start having, me, we did these things, Ron, on uh, war, we've done them on health care. I think it's time now to do it on the inequality things and on the economic issues that are challenging our country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Put them out there, yeah. make them take stands, and force them to stand before the public and say, no, we oppose child care. Yeah. We oppose minimum wages. I think that's exactly right. You know, United States, we've been known as the land of opportunity. Yeah. But that's turned around. You know, if you, look at, if you look at what happened with the tax code, 
if you look at what's happened with the influence of the super rich and the corporations uh, in the legislative process, they've twisted and turned so many things yeah. that they're capturing almost all the benefits of any kind of economic growth. And the possibility for someone who starts off you know, in the lower class, working hard and doing well, that is so much yeah. less than what it has been. It's almost gone. So many obstacles. For our parents that, yeah. and, for, yeah. and, for, and for me and for us, when we were, we were coming through, we had yeah. a real chance then. Absolutely. But the statistics show that that's, that's history. And that's not America. I mean, we, need, we, we can be the land of opportunity, but not without some pretty significant changes. Right. And I think that Obama was doing a great job in terms of setting out a pathway mm -hmm. to, to, to recover uh, who we are as America in that respect. And that would capture more of America as opposed yes. to, you know, exactly. And so what top. you're saying, we need to bring these discussions back to the libraries, you know, back to, the, to our college campuses, back to our communities, because yeah. people see this. Yeah. They're aware yeah. that, 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 you know, they're, that they're working hard, and they are not getting ahead. The middle class is actually falling further behind, and that's because of policy. That's because of, of the tax yeah. structure, and that's because of what George Bush and several Congresses over many years have given us, sometimes Democrats, yeah. And it's time to move in a different yeah. direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think because we aren't doing that, we aren't forcing those kinds of discussions, people are feeling powerless, discouraged, and losing hope. Yeah. But I think once they see that it's possible to challenge these things, then people gain yeah. hope, and they go out there, and they're willing to do yeah. things. Don, you and I have often made reference to the, the story from the early days of the New Deal when Franklin Delano Roosevelt first took office and uh, uh, union leaders came to see him and they outlined uh, their agenda of what they wanted the new president to do. And Roosevelt listened to them carefully and uh, at the end of their presentation he said to them, I agree completely with what you're presenting. Now go make me do it. <laughs> it's right? exactly it. Go make exactly. me do it. And, and I think we have another example of that uh, recently, the, the film Selma. Now, there's some controversy over how Lyndon Baines Johnson yeah. is actually portrayed in the mm -hmm. film and that he's viewed, he's shown as a bit more of an obstacle to uh, civil rights or the Voting Rights Act than perhaps he really was, according to, to some historians. But nonetheless, I think there's still a real lesson there is that Johnson himself was basically relying on Martin Luther King and the civil rights yeah. movement and, and other allies to go out there and make him do it, or at least help that's him right. make the Congress mm -hmm. do it at that time. So I think that's the point you're getting at, that without that kind of mobilization, without sort of mass social movements out there that are pressing for the changes, it's difficult for any president. You can outline an agenda like this, but when you've got an obstructionist Congress yeah, like this, and you've got Democrats who are also somewhat timid and wavering, I think, on many of these or issues, run, right? Outright running away from uh, the president. Yeah, yeah, during the campaign, some of them ran completely away from the president and didn't, didn't want to be photographed with him or anything. So, so I think, yeah, there has to be that other kind of pressure. And absent that pressure, we don't seem to make any kind of advances, right. do we? It's, uh, I mean, Howard Zinn made this perfectly clear in a lot of the work that he did, that it's the mass social movements that are, are critical to the success of progressive uh, agendas. You know, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. We, you know, our listeners here, if you want to see another generation of all the benefits going to the top 1%, then just, then just keep quiet. Yeah. Just, just, just stay at home, and that's what you're going to see. Because if we don't see people standing up, then we're not going to see the changes we need. But there's another change from the 60s that I think is similarly important, and that is we've seen the role of money in exactly. politics yeah. just take off like an airplane. Mm -hmm. And um, the challenge there, and this is, this is Democrats and Republicans, is it's mostly the big corporations and the super rich who are able to make these enormous campaign contributions, who are able to spend millions of dollars. The Koch brothers have just set out set out they're going to spend as much as the entire Republican Party spent in, uh, all together in the, in the last election. Wasn't it 900 million dollars? Yeah, 900 million dollars. They were going to spend almost a oh, billion dollars. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. Oh my God. And the point is that if because it costs so much, we know, we know about this, <laughs> because it costs so much to run for Congress yeah. these days, that that makes people in Congress dependent 
yeah. on those campaign That's contributions. Exactly right, and they're not getting those big contributions from middle class. No. no. They're getting from no. the, the people who want to protect their privilege, yeah. who want to protect their tax breaks. Mm -hmm. and, and if we really want to see progressive change, we've got to make it so that people in Congress are dependent on us, yeah. on the people, yeah. on the voters. And that's going to take campaign finance reform. And you know, if there was one thing that I wish the president had said a little bit more about, right. I, I wish he could have present, pushed harder there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's such a good point. Well, well, both of you have had this experience, of course, in running for Congress. And, and I know that probably the most distasteful thing about the, the campaigns that you ran was having to continually ask people for money. And well, more you money. call it distasteful. OK, well, there, there, mean, there are moments <laughs> there. There are <laughs> moments. But I'll tell you, Rod, when I'm asking people for money to run for Congress, I'm not asking for money for me. No, no, no. You know, no. no. I'm, I'm saying it's not a distasteful thing. Oay. Because what I'm talking to people about is you rally where do we want this country to go? Yeah. 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 You know, do you want to have more trickle-down economics? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not asking them to give me for money for something that, yeah. that, that's going to just help me out. I'm going to say, do you want to tart, help to create the country that you want for your children, or mm -hmm. for your grandchildren? Mm -hmm. And that's not distasteful. Okay. But the problem comes, you have to spend so much of your time right. doing right. that rather time. than talking to people yeah. and mo yeah. mobilizing yeah. people. Yeah. That's, that's very true. Well, that's not, very not true. only that, you have to do it once you're in office, too. Exactly. The vast majority right. of congressmen and senators' time who are, who are in the mindset that they're going to run again, is they're raising money. Yeah, oh, yeah they're raising exactly. Money. Well, Fundraisers, in lobbyists, the house, you know. You know you're two, every two years, you're, you're yeah, up again, right? Yeah, so, right. so you start right away. Yeah, and even the senators with their right. six-year uh, term uh, start in right away and, and doing that. And, so and, and the New York Times is reporting on how Citibank literally wrote the, wrote the law. They sent in the text, and the people in the Congressional Committee, they just put it right there oh. in the law to regulate Citibank, <laughs> my goodness, it's no, it's no surprise that they're getting yeah. these massive bailouts when the middle class is falling behind, when yeah. students you know, have these enormous uh, interest rates on their student loans, and Citibank is getting you know, a quarter of a percent, less than a quarter of a percent for, for, for their loans. It's no surprise when they're writing the laws. Oh. That comes back to Elizabeth Warren's speech that yes. she gave, and then yes. she alluded to that, the influence yes. that these, that these huge banks have. Even after 2008, she's saying, listen, we're still dealing with the same sets of problems that we thought we were going to deal with in 2008 and were dealt with, and now we find out that no, nothing's changed. It's business as usual. Yeah, right. Uh, yes. Is it, is it too strong a term to say that we have a system of legalized bribery? <laughs> I, don't, I think that's accurate. Is that too strong that's a term? That's right where we are. I mean, yeah, that's it right really where we are. seems to be where we are. I mean, yeah. if the Koch brothers can give $900 million <laughs> to candidates, they're not giving that money uh, just for charity, they, they no, expect they, something. They expect in access return. and influence. And, and, and the research supports that. The research shows that companies where their executives and their senior employees make larger campaign contributions, they make more profits than companies that don't make these campaign contributions. Now, this is not because, this is not. American entrepreneurism. Yeah. This is not doing better because you have a better product because you work harder. This is doing better because you pay off the right people. <laughs> You're and greasing the skids. <laughs> You're greasing right. the skids. And, and that's undermining our economy. Oh, that's, hurting, that's hurting everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I, I, I think that as this continues, we continue down a very slippery slope right. until our people are in desperate condition situations. Um, and it's it's so, the people at the bottom now are suffering right. so much. Right. It's just unbelievable. Right. And we're not making the serious efforts to deal with that. Right. But you know, like you're saying, our people are in a very a desperate situation right now. Yeah. Right now. And again, to come back to the president's speech, even though there are the issues with campaign finance, mm -hmm. nevertheless, it, as a democracy, at the, in the, at the end of the day, it comes down to who goes, who goes to the polls, yep. how, how they vote. And he's setting up the basis for such a contrast between yes. an, an agenda that's going to rebuild the middle class, an agenda that's mm -hmm. going to work to make an inclusive yeah. economy, and this bi this business that we've we've seen from Republicans for year after year that is created the top one percent getting almost all the benefits. Right. And so as as we have these as we get the information out there, as we have these discussions, and people figure that out. Then I think that you know uh, do uh, our democracy has has a real chance to move in a better direction. We have to we have to convince people that have given up and thinks that 
legislation is irrelevant. Right. That the whole legislative system doesn't have anything to do with my life. Right. I mean, that's why uh, the voter mm -hmm. turnout is so terrible in yeah. poor in areas because yeah. people right. don't yeah. see that it's changing in their lives. But if we can right. show right. that, hey, this would make a difference, and if Paul Clements is elected to Congress, he's going to fight for that, and it will make a difference in your life. That gives him some hope. Right. And I'm very happy that the president had laid, has laid out an agenda yep. that creates an opportunity for us in this district and for Democrats across the country to have that conversation. Yeah. Yes. yes. The, the, the issue of voter turnout, I mean, it seems to me, looking back at the election, the, the dark money that came in obviously had yeah. a big impact on a lot of races, but it seems to me that the low voter turnout mm -hmm. really was crippling to many Democratic candidates. I think oh, certainly sure. that was a, an element right. in, in your campaign. So how do we do something about that? How do we get people out there motivated to vote? I mean, the president's speech helping to set up this agenda, right. you're saying is one thing. What else do we need to do? And, and let me also just throw out now, we, we know that, uh, again, if, if people have seen Selma, they know the issue was voting rights, right? Yes, I mean, big time. I think the movie is fantastic in, in portraying that history. When the, the character played by Oprah Winfrey yeah. goes in and wants to register to vote, just to try to register yeah. to vote, and she's subjected to that humiliating uh, test, literacy test imposed by that, the jerk of a clerk, right? I mean, you just, you want to jump through the screen at this yeah, guy, right? right. And uh, he makes her, he says she has to name every one of the judges in Alabama in order to be able to register to vote. Well, of course you can't do that. So, I mean, and, and people didn't real. I mean, I, I don't think a lot of younger people don't realize no you had to pay a tax yep. to, a poll tax, or you had to take a literacy test, or again, and you were just subjected to outright violence. And so, yeah. People were prevented from voting, and this is what motivated the Voting yeah. Rights Act in 1965. And of course, that 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 was a successful campaign in the end. But now we're seeing that uh, many of the gains that were made by that particular piece of federal legislation have been undone. Yeah. We have the uh, the recent decision. What was it, Holder versus Alabama or Alabama, Georgia? I forget which state it was, but. But basically, it uh, invalidated some sections of the uh, mm -hmm. Voting Rights Act, which yeah. said that the, the states that had the worst history of restricting voting had to get federal approval yeah, for any changes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, so and now, so they're now they're free to do whatever they want to again, in a sense. And many of those states rushed in with all kinds of uh, voter, voter restrictions. Yeah. Right? Right. So we're seeing a massive campaign by re the Republican Party, and let's put this right on the line. Absolutely. It's the Republican Party that is mostly passing these restrictions on the rights of people to vote in, in many different states because they know they will not get those voters and the only way that they can have electoral success often is to keep the vote yeah. down, right? To, yeah. to restrict yeah. the vote, to, to make sure that minorities and young people uh, and other constituencies that are, that are more likely to vote for Democratic candidates are, are kept out, right? Long lines, create long lines, you know, don't allow same day registration. Uh, on and on and on, yeah. voter yeah. IDs. Uh, so that's another part of the puzzle here that I think we've, we've, in terms of looking at how do we get more people out to vote, I think that's another piece yeah. of the puzzle to yeah. look at these voter restriction <coughs> laws that are being enacted. So. That's really an important piece um, because they're doing everything they can to intimidate people and to make it impossible for them to vote. So that, that's a big piece of it. Um, and then I think it's going to take a while to convince a lot of people uh, who are at the bottom that it's worthwhile to vote. I think that both matters, those yeah. things, that it matters, yeah. that those two things and, and, that, and I think that just requires more grassroots efforts. So one of the things that I'm particularly pleased with out of the stuff that happened in Ferguson was the amount of young people that exactly. have been involved in protests exactly. all across the country right. who are not, not just for Ferguson, but now they're, they're staying in the game. And that because that's where it starts. Because everybody has said that this past generation is much more apathetic than, say, generations of mine who grew up in the 60s. But yeah. what I'm seeing now with, the, with these younger people is they're willing to get involved. They're willing to get involved on, on, across the number of, of what, I can, what we consider complex issues. Yeah. And I think that matters. That's going to be helpful. It definitely. Especially right. at the community level. Yes. Yeah. And these, a lot of these young people are young people who have not been engaged yeah. before. And now they are. Yeah. And they're so enthusiastic. we have to capitalize on it. And again, often they just don't have the history. They don't no. have yeah. the background. No, yeah. the, no, no, no. The, they don't understand 
the, some of the struggles that have gone on in the past and why some of these things still need to be struggled over, I think. And that's why it was particularly poignant for my nine-year-old granddaughter to, to see Sama, because she didn't realize just how tough it was for people of my parents' generation yeah. to be able to vote. Yeah. So I went on and told her the story about the, the reason that my family came to Michigan, my grandfather and my father, was because they left, they left Arkansas because they wanted to have more dignity in their life. So they moved as part of that great migration. And I said, this is why, this is why your great, great grandfather came to Michigan in wow. the 1940s because wow. the rights of a citizen that he wanted to have, he couldn't get them where he lived at. So he came here. And so when she saw that movie, then it started to resonate with us because she, I guess she really realized for the first time just how bad it was. Wow. You know, things we take for granted today. And she's nine. And she's nine. I'm getting that response from college students in my class when they go to see it. They, that's all news yeah. to them. I mean, they don't know it, and they're much closer yeah. to it, you know? It's, it's very interesting. Um, not knowing it is, is a big thing. Yeah. Not knowing what went before. Not knowing how we got in this spot. You know, it, it, it's certainly true that a lot of the students we have today in our classes mm -hmm. don't really understand and appreciate the history there. Yeah. But one of the things that, that really gives me a lot of encouragement is the amount of concern and interest there is among students these days in, in, in issues of the environment yeah. and yes. particularly climate change. Mm -hmm. All right. With my campaign, I probably had 20 or 25 student interns. Very um, Right. And, and the, the, the ones who were the most involved, who, who did like the hardest work and who were the greatest interns, got in because they care about the environment, because they want to have a planet and, an, and a future that will work for their children and for, yeah. their, and for their grandchildren. I have the opportunity to, to speak in a few days to um, some students at Kalamazoo College. And they're, they're organizing a divestiture campaign. And I, you, you've been doing some work on this. You've been doing some work on this with students at Western. And they see that if their university, which is supposed to be for the public good, which is supposed to be an educational institution, if they're putting their money into corporations that are um, not just generating uh, carbon pollution, but that, have, that, have, that, are, that are making more investments in trying to find more reserves at this time, when the reserves they already have are, are would, would, would generate five times as much carbon pollution as we can stand to, to, to stop it at the limit that everyone has agreed to. You know, they see that if, that if, their, if, that if their universities are participating in killing off the planet, then this is something that they need to take action on. Um, and I was delighted that the president made such a very a strong statement that we yes. have to have American leadership. But you know, um, here we see our, our congressman, Congressman Upton, also, uh, the se senator who's on, on their energy committee, they're both um, climate science deniers. Climate deniers. Yeah. Right? So, so I would be very surprised if they came forward on this issue. You know, I'm delighted the president is, is doing what he can, but he says we want to have American leadership. We can't have the really strong leadership that we need without congressional support. Yeah. He's done some great things. Yeah. He's done more than any president anywhere in the world, not just any American president. He's done more than any president anywhere to personally push actions that will re reduce more carbon pollution. But that's nowhere near enough. To get where we need to be, we've got to go much further than that. And we have both the House and the Senate, the leaders of the, of the key committees, pushing in the opposite direction. And that is going to be an issue for mobilization. Yeah. That's yes. going to be an issue that the yes. young people care about because it's their future. Um, so uh, I've seen, I think we've seen, we've seen great movement there already among students, among young people, and I think we'll see more of that. Yeah, that's so important. Did, did Fred Upton say anything at all during the, I don't remember, did he say anything at all during the campaign about climate change? Yeah, he, he actually... You didn't have a chance to debate him. Well, he, we, 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 we proposed a debate, he agreed to it, mm -hmm. and then the day before he pulled out. Yeah. yeah. All right, so he, he didn't want to have a debate, but um, he did come for an interview with the Kalamazoo Gazette, and they say, well, you know, tell us, do you, do you believe in climate change? He says, yeah, the weather changes. It was, it was, it was like, it was the coldest winter ever uh, this last, or one of the coldest winters we've had, we've had for a long time this last winter. The, the weather changes. I believe in climate change. Uh, uh. Right? And they pushed him on that. And they pushed him on it. And he wasn't prepared to say that he accepts the conclusion of science today that we're heading in um, this terribly dangerous direction and we need to get climate, we need to get carbon pollution uh, under control. 
So yeah, they made that very yeah. clear. That's online for anyone to see. You know, uh, um, the, the, the editor from the Gazette, he's kind of pushing him. And Fred is kind of squirming back, squirming this way, going that way, and he can't quite get around it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, would, mm -hmm. I think people, you know, I would encourage people to take a look at it. It it's, 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 uh, makes good watching. Yeah. He didn't, didn't pull out that line that he's not a scientist, did he? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if he used that or not. A lot of I mean, people have been saying that. Uh, and a lot of Republicans sort of use that as their, right. their way to sort of duck and dodge the issue. And I, I thought the president was yes, very he good. Go he came right out and got him on that. He says, well, I'm not a scientist either. Right. But I know a lot of good scientists over at NASA <laughs> and NOAA. And what they're telling me is, you know, we're right. in big trouble here. Right. We've got to do something about, yeah. about uh, climate change and uh, carbon emissions. And, so I think that's one of the best ways to, to handle that because, because it, I mean, it's just ridiculous. The science is so overwhelmingly yeah. clear Not even about close. The, what, right. what's happening Not close. and who, that humans are responsible, that it's carbon emissions uh, that, are, that are driving the process. And, 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 and the Pentagon, the Pentagon has said that, that climate change is one of the main generators of the kind of conflict that the American military may need to deal with need to be taken into consideration for military planning in the future. Well, I don't think that, I don't want to have the military no. as the primary means of dealing with this, mm -hmm. but if they're taking it that seriously for their, for their planning purposes, then I, it's hard for me to see how the Republicans are saying, well, no, we don't really need to be addressing this. Mm -hmm. well, what I find fascinating is that we know that human beings impacted our water supply. Nobody disputes that anymore. There's the same argument back in the 20s and 30s that we could just dump anything we wanted to in the oceans and our yeah. lakes and streams, and we quickly realized that no, that's and we were responsible for this. Yeah. So we changed yeah. our policies, and I don't. So I have a difficult time understanding why people can't understand that we can pump all this stuff into the atmosphere and think it has no impact at all right. on what happens around the planet. Right. And the, the, I think that it was the mayor of Beijing today who said, "Our city is unlivable." because of the level of particulates that are in the air on, on any given day makes this city unlivable. And you're talking about what, almost, almost, what, two million people? Two, two to seven million people that live in, I think, in Beijing is a pretty huge city. Yeah. But it says the city's unlivable. And, and moving towards solar and wind is going to create more local control. It's yeah. going to actually create more jobs. Yeah, I was going to say that. There's jobs. more jobs yeah. there yes. than there is the alternative. And the economic cost is just a, a minor percentage point of, of, of GDP. In, in, in the yep. short term, and then that gets away from enormous costs, both in the present and in the future. But you know, part of the challenge is that these big oil companies that our university and, and Kalamazoo College and other places are invested in, they have been fighting tooth and nail, right. you know, cleverly. They don't want to. They don't want to make it clear what they're doing. But my goodness, they certainly are doing it to block any kind of change that's going to hurt their profits. You know, because we now know that the alternatives to fossil fuels price-wise have come way down. It's almost, it's yeah. almost, a, almost right. a direct comparison there. Right. Yeah. So they can no longer make that argument, well, right. solar costs X amount of thousands of dollars, so it's, right. it's unreasonable for the average person or the average company. We know now that that's not the case. No. And, and Prices one, are comparable. And one question is, are we going to have the United States producing these windmills? That's it. Are yeah. we the ones who are going to be producing these solar panels and the, and the more energy efficient yeah. um, equipment? You know, one of the, I think that the great uh, the, the favor that the president did for, for um, our auto companies was to set the CAFE standard of 54 miles per yeah. gallon because those are going to be the cars that are going to be in high demand in the coming years as countries around the world move towards reducing their carbon pollution. So he's helping the auto industry by pushing the, the miles per gallon standard right, higher. Right. And we need to be doing that across the board. And you know, in my, in my, my college, KVCC, we have a wind turbine yeah. program there. Right. And yes. we can't produce enough graduates fast enough no to go kidding. into this work. Wow. Right. You know, we're talking 96, 97% placement race when, when individuals graduate from that program. So we know there's a need out there. And, and within two or three years, some of your students, I know this, they're, they're making $80,000 yeah. a year. Yeah, easily. I right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Because the demand's out there. I mean, yeah. we've had folks from all over the world come to the college to ask us about what we're doing and, and see where we can collaborate with them. And some, some of the folks who've graduated have ended up in places not only across the country, but internationally too, because people want that expertise, because they know that this is the coming wave. But yeah. I, I, I want to bring us back to another, talk about education, to, to another piece of that, and coming back to the President's comments about making free community college. Right. Because one of the things that we've realized is that while United States was the leader 
in making free primary and free, free secondary school right. you know, way back in, 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 in the early part of the 20th century. We've actually fallen behind a lot of countries in the world in terms of our wow. education system. Yeah. And if there's, besides the environment, if there's one area where we, we need to make deep changes in, in where we're investing in this country, it's got to be education. Yes. Now, people talk about this a lot, but when you talk about it as, well, you know, another 1% here, another 2% there, that's not the issue. If we want to address poverty in this country, if we want to be, continue to be the leading economy, the leading, having the leading entrepreneurship, we have to have a, the best educated population in the world, and we're a long ways away from that. Oh. We can do it, but, but it's going to take major investments starting in um, pre-kindergarten, uh, improving K through 12. Yeah. We have the best higher education in the world. But we've got to make it affordable again. I was delighted that the president talked about lowering student loan rates. Yes. Because, I mean, we're seeing this from our students all the time. Mm -hmm. There are so many of them who end up, there is more college debt today in this country than credit card yeah. debt. And that's blocking these graduates from getting started with their lives. We have got to address these issues yeah. in education or, or, or the chance for the middle class to come back is greatly diminished. Yeah, right. And the president proposed, I think, what, $60 billion was the price tag on the free community college yeah, right. thing. And that's just a, that's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, that's a modest what you're amount, talking yeah. about. Right. We would need to go much further than what the president proposed. Right. And it's got to go beyond community colleges. Right. That's a good starting point. Right? Free K. To get free the, K. The, the, right. gotta, yeah. It's got to be for the younger, uh, yeah. younger generation, but we've also got to look at how can we get more investment in higher education, yeah. more investment in science. Right. Uh, in this country. We're falling far behind in terms of uh, right. science. Uh, I mean, th this whole concept of social investments, I think, yeah. is, a, is a key component of uh, the progressive campaign. And it seems to me that that's something that is a winnable issue with voters, is to say, look, you know, we have to make important social investments. It's the responsible mm -hmm. thing to do. And when we make these investments, the returns are going to be are much greater right. in the long right. run. Right. Yes, we may have to pay a little bit more in taxes right now, which calls into you know the whole question right. of uh, reforming the tax structure itself. Hmm. But making these investments, social investments, is the responsible thing to do, right. and it will produce all kinds of important public gains right. for us down the road. Right. And I think most voters, if you lay it out to them in that manner, that's that's a winning yeah, issue they, with they a lot of voters. It. They understand uh, it. Too. And uh, yeah. so whether it's uh, ed education or science or infrastructure, infrastructure yeah. oh yeah. my gosh, right. if anybody's driven around the roads <laughs> uh, in our state, and of course this. Just as an aside, our, our state legislature, what a ridiculously <laughs> cowardly action yeah. that they took That's in their lame stuff. duck section. The session, they couldn't even come up with a plan to fix our roads. They had to kick the can down the road and throw it off on a, on a vote uh, in the spring to uh, raise the Senate, you know, which is gonna be a horrible campaign and a horrible vote, and they'll probably lose, actually, and our roads aren't gonna get fixed. But making those kind of investments, uh, mass transit, I mean, coming right. back to the climate change issue, why yeah. aren't we making the investments? I mean, almost every other country in the world makes major investments in mass transportation. Right. Why don't we? And this is going to be one of the keys to reducing carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. right. And we're nowhere to be seen on that issue. I mean, we have a pitiful mass transportation system. And that was an interesting country. contrast for when I, I spent a, um, a month in Italy in 2005. And the thing that stuck out to me the most was the, the use of public transportation by all classes of people wow. in Italy. Whether we were in Rome, Florence, Venice, everybody used mass transit. Very few people, there, there, there is car ownership there, but most people were content to use mass transit because they realized that this is better for the environment. It saves a lot of money. You know, it's, it's less costly for those individuals. They were already well advanced in that, and, and we found that to be the case in Germany and some of the other countries that we visited. And, and I said to myself, why not back home? They yeah, make it convenient, you know, yeah. right? They make it yeah. easy to take mass transit, right. and why wouldn't you? And yeah. the thing is that we have had subsidies for, for our automobiles, for our yeah, cars, right. for generations. And we have not been prepared to put that same, just, just to make it even, to put the basic resources into trains and buses and mass transit systems. Yeah. And we, gotta, we, we should turn that around. Absolutely. So, yeah. so on, the, on the tax issue, again, on the one hand, we, we can talk about the, uh, the subsidies and the, uh, 
you know, the loopholes that allow the corporations and the wealthy not to pay their fair share. And they're not, they're not paying their fair share at right. all. But there's also the issue of just the more generalized opposition to taxes. I mean, yeah. the Republicans make it seem like when you pay taxes, that money just goes out there and it goes into a black hole and nothing ever comes of it. Uh, and and I, th I think that, that notion has to be, we have yeah. to really address that because right. what we're talking about in terms of education and transportation and infrastructure and so forth is these are the, the, these are the gains, these are the positive outcomes of paying your fair share of taxes, right. paying your dues as a citizen, yeah, you right. get lots of good things yeah, sure. for your taxes. Yeah. Uh, lots of good things, and uh, we could get lots of lots more good things uh, if we if we revamped our tax system and uh, made these kind of investments. But but again, so many Republicans talk as if somehow taxes go right into Barack Obama's pocket and never yeah. never produce any kind of of goods out there. And I think that's part of the ideological struggle that. Uh, progressives and, and, and that's Democratic been going on Party. since the Reagan administration because that was that was part of their mantra that you know you you pay too much in taxes right and that narrative right. has carried forth so now you have you have politicians who who, who campaign who won't use that word no and they can come from start. states or yeah. districts where their infrastructure is really struggling and realizing this stuff costs money it's not inexpensive at all it has to be paid for and if we just keep pushing off to subsequent generations then the cost goes up and is exactly. higher, you know, which is where we are now with our infrastructure. By doing a cost-benefit analysis and all you kind of the cost and not the benefit. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let's switch over, unless somebody has something oh, else good. on the domestic good. and economic issues, but let's switch over and talk a little bit about uh, foreign policy. Uh, it seems that uh, the president kind of slighted foreign policy overall in the speech, and I think that was intentional because he really wanted to hammer on this domestic agenda, the economic, sure. the middle class economics yeah. issue. So, uh, and it was, it turned out to be the shortest State of the Union that he's ever given, but it still went almost yeah. an hour, so you, you can't cover everything. But uh, it, it seems to me that uh, there were some, some disappointments to me in terms of the foreign policy issues. And the biggest disappointment was the drone issue, uh, because he right. seemed to, pa he mentioned it, but he mentioned it in passing, he passed mm -hmm. over it rather quickly and essentially seem to suggest that, uh, well, this is a necessary program and we're doing everything we can to make sure that w the targets are appropriate targets. And that's about all that he had to say about right. it. Did anybody else have any reaction to the discussion of drones? No, I, I don't, I don't think trouble? that he really wanted to go there because I don't think as a foreign policy tool, we really have a handle on how these things actually work with, with respect to collateral damage because there seems yeah. to be that seems to be a recurring theme that when we use these drones we end up killing it we end up maybe targeting the person that we want to target but we also kill all a lot of innocent people right. too right the, and with the, the very hearts and minds that we say we want to change we're alienating people yeah it becomes a recruiting tool yeah. for the terrorists and and i think that his basic thought is, this is an alternative to sending troops. This is an alternative to war. Okay, we don't like it. People get killed, but it's better than sending the troops in. I think that's his philosophy. Yeah. On that. And it may very well be the case, so. Try, trying to avoid boots on the ground, so yeah. the drones provide a way to keep doing the things that the military wants to do without... Uh, risky in American soldiers' lives, I guess. Is, uh, but, so. but he also wants to make the point that we're leading by the example of our values. Yeah. And as you're saying, you know, killing innocent victims, right. that's not American value. No. You know, no. I mean, this may have some short-term benefit with the drones, but if, it's, if, it has a, if, if it creates so much resentment that it's feeding and contributing to things like terrorism in the long run, yeah. then maybe it's not worth, worth what he's saying. That, that's absolutely true, absolutely true. The other thing I was troubled with was the idea that he's going to request an authorization from Congress to uh, target ISIS, uh, the Islamic, uh, Islamic group uh, in Syria and, and Iran. And I was troubled by, uh, again, it's just a bold assertion that I want congressional authorization to go ahead and, and continue another aspect of this uh, misbegotten war in the Middle East. Uh, yeah. Does anybody else? Anybody else pick up on that or? Well, you know, it's funny. I was listening to Joe Scarborough about a month and a half ago on Morning Joe, and he was saying that we should admit in this country that we really don't know what we're doing in the Middle East. Right. He said we need to admit that. We spent 10 years in two wars there, and what have we gotten 
in terms of our, in terms of our, you know, our loss of blood and treasure. Not a whole lot. Are we, have we left those countries in better shape than they were when we came there? He oh said, that's God. debatable. And I think as James Fallows in this month of Atlantic says, basically says the same thing in the lead article. How is it that the best army in the world continues to be, continues to get defeated yeah. in these wars? Because I don't think we really have an idea of what it is we're looking for, what our objectives are. Yeah. We, we get in, but we don't have any way to get out. Exactly. I mean, if you say leave the country better, Iraq, we certainly are not even that no. country better. And we've set them back how many years? And w what, what was the benefit yeah. of all that? No. Wasting a lot of human resources, wasting a lot of economic resources, and then we jump to one country, to another, to another. Andrew Bacevich, I think, is really writes well mm -hmm. on this whole thing about how, you know, we have to think what's possible and what's reasonable, and what we're doing there is neither. You know, cer certainly, I mean, I can, I, I, I can and do disagree and quibble with the president on, on, on several aspects of foreign policy, but if we compare our current president, President Obama, to President Bush, yeah. Who, who got us into yeah, this war right. on false pretenses, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, mm -hmm. who, who created so much, so much of this problem. I have a little bit of a difference on the, the so-called Islamic State th situation, and that is that, you know, I think that they really are um, a, a very, very dangerous uh, organization that we've seen in terms of their willingness to just decapitate journalists mm -hmm. and completely innocent people. Um, that they're setting up these, these, these taxation systems that are basically extortion, extortionistic, um, that they, they are not committed to any, anything which is rem remotely close to the rule of international no, law. No. I think they're potentially a far more disruptive sort of organization than even what we've been, for the most part, facing in the Middle East, which, which is difficult enough just to start with. In that context, the thing which I, I agree with, with the president is he's saying, let's work with our allies. Let's work through diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Let's work with a multinational approach. Because if we don't see the neighbors, people in the neighborhood, they're the ones who are immediately threatened. They have the most by to lose, the Islam. Yeah. They have the most to lose. And so, and so I think that, you know, if, if it had been John McCain, we'd be in there with, with, with our boots, boots on the ground today. Yeah. Let, let's be aware of that. Oh, I have no doubt about that. Right. But the question I would ask would be, the answer is always militarism. Okay, diplomacy, right. he's saying diplomacy. Right. I think one of the questions we have to ask is, what is driving people to join these things? And how can we change that? Yeah. What about the people in France and in other countries right. that are saying, this is a better answer than we got right now? And how can we change that? And I think the drone stuff has a lot to do with that because they use that very cleverly with their social media yeah, to bring these yeah. people in. I mean, I think if they would see us as living up to our ideals yeah. and the champion of the ordinary person, we would stop that recruiting a lot better. Well, I don't disagree with you, but when he talked about uh, being an example with our values, the key issue he talked about was our democracy. Yeah. That while, while our Congress is so utterly dysfunctional, mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone around the world saying, oh, the leading democracy in the world, United States, do we really want that type of democracy? <laughs> yeah. Right? If we've got to demonstrate that democracy works for the people, mm -hmm. and frankly today our democracy is not working for Very the people, and Very that's true. that's where we can most effectively right. lead with our values. So, you know, maybe his focusing primarily on the domestic agenda, maybe that wasn't so far off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. It's a, well, again, we're getting a little bit short of time here. Uh, another issue that, uh, that I wanted to, to throw out is the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, oh, right. the uh, yep. trade, International Trade Agreement. And uh, so, Paul, I'm particularly interested. I know you have a lot of uh, interest and concerns in this area. So what, what's your take on the President's position here and on, on the TPP in general? Well, you know, I mentioned just a moment ago that I don't always agree with the President. And I think, frankly, this is an area where, where I think he's making a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, that, if, that part of the challenge is that the specific details of the Trans-Pacific Partnership have not been negotiated no. in, an, in an open, right. accountable way. It's all been very private. Now we hear that the, the CEOs and lawyers for these big corporations, they seem to know what's going on. 
But the voters, you and I, we, we don't have access to that. So just in terms of the way it's being done, for these things to be done uh, without, it, without, without transparency, that's a problem. From the little bit that we hear, it sounds as though, you know, there are certainly environmental issues, there are certainly labor issues, but even beyond that, it, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership seems to set up judicial mechanisms where, for example, if we here in the United States, if we here in, in, in you know, your, if, the Kalamazoo City Commission, if you were to set up some kind of environmental regulation that cost a foreign company, you know, where they had to increase their, their taxes or increase their fees or whatever, it could create a situation where they could go not to the federal government, not to the, not, not to the local courts, they could go to some international TPP court and, and sue you. I mean, yeah. my goodness. My goodness, it, it's taking control. away, it, we yeah. lose control, we lose, up, we, lose, we lose the basic freedom to promote the values that are, that are fundamental American values. Um, and, and we're giving that up for, for the purpose of a narrow economic profit-based system that we're not getting that much from to start with. So I, I'm very concerned about that. I, I've referred to that whole process as the criminalization of corporate crime control. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. you know, any effort to try to regulate or control corporate behavior, yeah. they can go and have it declared illegal. They can, that's in right. a sense, criminalize it. That's so. right. All right. Well, we only have two minutes left. So uh, what do you guys think about what's going to happen with uh, the Obama agenda in Congress? Uh, any, any quick insights in two minutes? Paul? <laughs> I, think, I think that he will probably get 25%. So I think the Republicans will, will see that, that they will just be completely committing suicide if they just do nothing. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's not going to be nearly enough, and the 75% that he's not going to get will be plenty for the Democrats to run on and to demonstrate that if we want to build a middle class economy that works for, for all Americans, that we need some fundamental political change in this country. Really? And I would agree with that. I mean, this is, this is going to be an, a huge opportunity for both parties to demonstrate to the American people where they actually stand, what matters to them. And it's clear that the Democrats have at the, at the core of their viewpoint what happens in the middle of them, what happens to the middle of America, those people in the middle class. Are we going to be creating opportunities for these folks to be able to move up in advance? Or are we going to deny those opportunities and stick with the status quo? And I think the Republicans are going to have to differentiate themselves there, and I think they're going to have a difficult time doing it because they seem to be anti-everything. Mm. There's anything to do that's going to give it, the average American any sort of advantage, whether it's college loans, whether it's daycare, whether it's pre-K. They seem to be anti any of those things, and I think that's going to be detrimental for them in the long run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You get I, the last word. Okay, I think the it's issue is not what... Word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be what happens in Congress, it's what happens in the community. We can't wait till 2016 to start organizing around these things. We have to organize them right now and confront the people that are in power now and mobilize people to fight for those things. Agreed, agreed. Well, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us on Critical Issues Alternative Views. I want to thank our guest today, Paul Clemens. Paul, it's always great to have you come on and provide some insights for us. And we invite you to come back next time to another edition of Critical Issues Alternative Views. Good night.